And uh, today I will tell you, as Stefan said, about my work in the in prostate cancer and specifically uh, our work that we're doing to characterize the prostate stroma transcriptome. So, um, okay. Um, so we study prostate cancer because it's one of the, you know, it's the most commonly diagnosed cancer in, in men and it's projected to be the 27 of cancer diagnosis in the United States men are projected to be from prostate cancer. It's also uh, takes 11% of estimated deaths from all cancers. So it is an important disease. Uh, it has long um, natural history and it is important to study the um, actual primary endpoint of the lethal prostate cancer, which we do have an opportunity with the data that we have. So the prostate cancer, it arises mainly in the uh, peripheral and transitional zones of the prostate. And so far, I'm sorry, I'm having issues with flipping my slides. Um, so far, the best clinical predictor that remains the best is the Gleason score. Gleason score is the morphology measure. So I have, okay. Um, so the, um, it is based on the morphology of the tissue. So basically the cells are graded by the pathologist and it's a measure of a differentiation. Uh, and the less differentiated cells are, the more aggressive cancer is, and the higher Gleason score is assigned. Uh, the, the way the tissues is scored is that uh, there will be usually multiple foci <clears throat> of cancer, and uh, the, what will happen is that the pathologist will estimate what is the prevalent pattern and assign the score to it, and then the second most prevalent pattern and assign the score to that one. And that, thus you will get the Gleason sum. So the lowest one, it will be three plus three, which is six. Then you ha we have seven, which is three plus four and four plus three. Then there is a eight, four plus four, and then so on, nine and 10. Uh, a long time ago, uh, it was noticed that the uh, Gleason score is a clinical uh, predictor of prostate cancer mortality. And it was noticed that even in Gleason 7s that are, were considered to be an intermediate, there is a difference between 3 plus 4 and 4 plus 4. And if there was more uh, of the pattern 4 prevalent, the hazard ratio was, you know, was higher than uh, com as compared to the 3 plus 4. And after you know, a certain, certain amount of years passed, now it is actually recognized and the grading uh, shifted from just using the Gleason score to so-called grade groups that actually takes into account the distinctions between sevens that are more and less aggressive. Right. So the background concepts uh, that I would like to discuss is uh, the about the prostate micro microenvironment the tumor microenvironment so the prostate cancer arises from the epithelial tissues so it's epithelial tissues that acquire genomic alterations uh, and become <clears throat> malignant however there is the whole microenvironment with multiple different cell types that surround uh, the epithelial cells and it has been shown in multiple publications now that uh, stroma influences cancer, uh, prostate cancer and cancer progression. And it is um, more and more recognized as an important driver of cancer progression. There have been some experimental evidence uh, from tissue cultures um, that altered stromal cells can induce tumor formation in non-cancerous prostate epithelial cells and in cell lines derived from prostate cancer. Uh, it was also uh, shown that benign prostate epithelial cells become more proliferative and ultimately undergo transformation when combined with prostate cancer-derived fi fibroblasts. It has been shown that cancer cells and cells in the cancer microenvironment, they co-evolve, they change, they acquire the ability to mimic the other cell types, 
Uh, it is also has been shown by Mike Eatman's group who uh, introduced the concept of reactive stroma, that the stromal compartment becomes reactive, that normal fibroblasts uh, getting replaced by the cancer associated fibroblasts, and the stroma provides a rapid response to altered homeostasis. So it is important to study the uh, prostate microenvironment and uh, the one of the questions that we had in our research goals uh, where the questions that whether we can improve upon Gleason score as a predictor of a lethal prostate cancer. What can we learn about prostate cancer differentiation progressive in biology by studying molecular correlates of the Gleason score, as well as what role is microenvironment playing in aggressive and non-aggressive disease, uh, particularly whether we can use the information in, from the stroma and tumor microenvironment to get, gain better understanding which men can potentially have fatal disease and should be treated, which men will have an indolent disease course and can potentially avoid or delay treatment. Uh, the other um, thing that we were thinking about actually is that now with a neoadjuvant treatment, what happens is that sometimes tumor disappears with a neoadjuvant treatment. So there is so-called pathological complete response. So when we're looking at those tissues, there is no more tumor cells to study, but however, microenvironment is still there. So comparing then molecular profiles for the patients who are responders and non-responders is then to, you know, to have a viable comparison, you, you have to do it in the microenvironment, either, otherwise you don't have a fair comparison. So that could be also interesting in that aspect as well. We're not doing that just yet, but I think that will be interesting um, to go forward. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know why it doesn't want to um, um, flip the slides smoothly. So with those uh, questions in mind, uh, we designed a laser capture micro dissection study. And the hypothesis was that the progression of normal prostate to prostate and epithelial neoplasia to invasive cancer is driven by molecular alterations in both epithelium and stroma. And it was previously shown by Dr. Nelson's group that in stroma, we do not really observe any genomic alteration. So the genome is stable. There are no mutations, no um, um, you know, amplifications, deletions, or anything. So it's more, it's on the DNA level, it looks nice and quiet, but uh, on the transcriptome level, apparently it is not. And uh, the other hypothesis is that stromal changes can potentially contribute to the lethality of prostate cancer and in general aggressiveness. So our questions were that we posed in the gene expression space is how are benign epithelia and benign stroma are different? How are malignant epithelia and malignant stroma are different? What is the difference between the prostates with and without tumors? And also if the benign stroma is different and, okay, that's double. And uh, also how does uh, prostate stroma transcriptome differs uh, with prostate cancer progression and aggressiveness? So whether there's any association with the Gleason score. So to answer this question, uh, the uh, following study was performed. So here are the uh, abbreviations that will, you will see throughout. So um, what we've done is we've taken from the prostates regions of um, tumor of invasive carcinoma. So laser cup. So this is you know mal malignant epithelium. This is the tumor from the RP specimens. The stroma that surrounds the tumor, normal epithelium, which we call benign, and B stands for it. Then the paired stroma that is remote from cancer and adjacent to the normal glands, which we call SB, we had the high-grade PIN, prost prostate inter uh, epithelial neoplasia, which we call P, and then the stroma surrounding PIN, which was called SP. As well, we took some admixture samples for some um, um, you know, to, to, to understand uh, the deconvolution methods that are now popular to estimate the cellularity. We will not um, be talking about this today, but if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about that next time. 
Uh, and this was a very, you know, relatively small study. It was large from laser capture marker dissection, but it was reasonably small. We have we had 25 radical prostatectomy specimens. 12 of them were with a Gleason grade 6 and 13 with Gleason grade 8 and above. And for each specimen, six regions of interest from radical prostatectomy specimen were taken. So we took all these six regions epithelial and surrounding stroma. We also had five cystoprostatectomy cases uh, where we had only two regions of interest because the cystoprostatectomy cases, they came from the patients who had surgery and their prostate removed as a part of their treatment for bladder cancer. It was confirmed on the pathology that they didn't have any prostate cancer and neither they had the um, high grade uh, pin. So from those patients, uh, we from those specimens, we took only two samples, which was, uh, we call them healthy stroma benign and health. Uh, so we have healthy benign tissue, healthy benign epithelial tissue, and healthy stroma surrounding this benign tissue. And we performed all possible pairwise comparisons to understand differences between tumor and stroma. Uh, differences between benign epithelium and, and stroma, as well as comparisons between uh, healthy tissue and the um, um, epithelium and stroma in the radical prostatectomy specimens. Uh, the uh, specimens, they came from multiple countries. There were specimens from Italy, Ireland, UK, United States. Uh, the prostate cancer cases that were selected had pure Gleason score six and pure, you know, Gleason score eight and above. So there were no intermediate Gleason seven cases, which could be uh, not that clear how to study because you will have the uh, both patterns uh, three and four. And uh, the, uh, the prostate uh, that uh, we looked at they were selected to not to have any atrophy or inflammation um, as well as uh, we needed to have uh, the normal prostate and surrounding stroma pain and surrounding stroma and cancer and surrounding stroma in the same block so the benign uh, tissue was actually reasonably close to tumor it was still on the same slide uh, the process of the uh, laser capture micro dissection was really uh, labor intensive. It took a couple of years uh, to perform this experiment. There were high resolution samples, uh, high, high resolution um, aperia scanned images that pathologists annotated. Uh, then they were laser capture micro dissected based on the pathologist annotations. Multiple ca caps were captured. And then the molecular readouts were done using the Fmetric survey. So uh, because these um, areas are so small, there had to be multiple areas from each specimen to get enough RNA for the analysis. Um, so we used the AFI arrays uh, for, for this analysis. And all these specimens, by the way, they were uh, formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissues that uh, have some, um, you know, issues with RNA quality, but it was overall a very successful project. So one of the important aspects is the data normalization. And here I'm just showing you the box plots of the log transformed raw data readout from the uh, microarrays. So uh, each box plots represent one sample uh, and they're colored according to their origin. We also had two controls. And you can see that you know, before normalization, they're all over the place. And some of them are better quality than the others. Some are very small. So you have small dynamic range of your expression value intensities. Some are larger. And uh, you know, overall, they're not comparable to each other. But after applying normalization, they will become nice and smooth. However, not all normalization methods are created equal. And uh, we actually had to be sneaky about how to, we analyze it. So uh, one of the very good methods for normalization for microarrays is a uh, robust multi-chip average. Uh, RMA normalization usually works pretty good. It produces very nice and smooth distribution uh, that we would like to see in our gene expression. However, in this experiment, 
when we looked at the principal components, this is using all genes on, um, on the chip. Each point represents a sample. And we project this gene expression vector of thousands of genes into a single point in the two-dimensional space. And we'll see how it looks like. And usually what happens is that on the first principal component, you usually see some kind of batch effect or some strange things that are not associated with the phenotype of interest. And here actually that happens. If you look at the color coding, these two clouds, they are, one of them is epithelial and the other is the stromal, but they're not separated on the uh, first principal component. It's the not the mo it's not the most striking difference that you see. We looked at the combat method that is a very popular and very good method to address the batch effects. But here we really, you can see with the symbols I plot you, we had two batches. There is not really a batch effect per se. There is something else going on that doesn't allow us to see the separation between epithelial and stromal tissue. And this, we believe in this data, should be the strongest signal. It is not observed on the first principal component. It's sort of somewhere on the second, more like between first and the second principal component. So what we've done, we developed a method that allowed us to actually get nice separation uh, between uh, epithelium and stroma on the first principal component. And what we've done is prior to running RMA normalization, what we've done is we regressed out from each probe certain technical variables. And those certain technical variables were just quality met met uh, metrics that you get from the array. So uh, we took the log background probes. So on the, on the FMetric arrays, they Mesh probes uh, that are not supposed to be hybridizing the actual RNA for, for, for the perfect, uh, as intended by the perfect match probes. So they represent the noise. So we have the log expression of that noise. We also looked at the percent of the probes that are present on the array that actually it corresponds to essentially the overall brightness of the array uh, in a sense. So if you have more probes showing up as present on the array, it means that it's, it's brighter, they, they, they light up better. So using these technical variables, we regress them out uh, from the raw data. Uh, for each probe, not even the probe set level, because each gene is measured by multiple probes on the FMetrics array. So um, after we remove these effects of these technical variables, uh, we then take the residuals from this regression and then we bump it back up to the original mean level of expression because otherwise they will be all sitting around zero. But we go back to overall brightness, but taking away the signal that is explained by these technical variables that are just property of these arrays that sh should be doing nothing with the biology. And after we are uh, getting this corrected data, we run the standard RMA normalization. And in that case, we've got a very good and nice separation between the epithelial and stromal components on the first principal component as we expected it to be. So we used that data for our uh, further analysis. For a moment, it was working, okay. So we performed, as I told you, the whole battery of the comparisons. And this is published work, we've done it several years ago, um, but I still wanted to, because it's a nice introduction, is a good you know, inspiration for our current work. So here I'm showing you the pathway enriched in epithelial and stromal compartments across healthy prostate tissues and stages of prostate cancer progression. So here you see the pathway that are enriched in the epithelium. Here are the pathways that are enriched in stroma. The comparisons that we made, we compared epithelium versus stroma in cystoprostatectomy samples. So this is the paired comparison. And here are three paired comparisons from radical prostatectomy samples. We compared the normal epithelium with the surrounding stroma, pin with the surrounding stroma, and tumor with the surrounding stroma. 
And these are these comparisons are located sort of on the x axis. So this is the comparisons in cystoprostatectomies. This is in benign, in pin, and then in tumor tissue and surrounding stroma. And what, what is interesting here is that we see that there will be a group of pathways that are enriched for the differentially expressed genes between epithelial and normal compartments across all stages of, um, you know, of prostate cancer progression, if you will. And uh, for epithelial, this category is amino acid metabolism. So uh, overall, epithelium and stroma will differ on amino acid metabolism. And uh, in the stromal categories, the uh, it, will, it will be um, pathways related to muscle development and localization. We see a lot of muscle development pathways when we're working with prostate because the normal prostate stroma is actually smooth muscle. And uh, when it, uh, when the, you know, cancer rises, all this reactive stroma, the, you know, this muscle tissue sort of starts accumulating the fibroblasts, they're myofibroblasts, they're sort of intermediate between smooth muscle and fibroblasts. And so that's why we have a lot of this muscle development. It's, it's, this is something that we expect to see. And then you can see that as the disease progresses, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have first you have pin, which then will eventually become cancer. We use the term progression loosely here. Uh, so we see that then there will be some um, pathways that will get dysregulated starting uh, from the, uh, you know, the, the, we already observe them in the differences between benign um, epithelium and the stroma surrounding it, but you know, in, in the sample that had prostate cancer nearby. And then these changes already acquired at that early stage are then, um, uh, you know, they, 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 you, you keep seeing them in, in, the, in the next levels of progression. Then you have some additional pathways that are added at the level when you get the pin and then the tumor. Then there are of course some pathways that are kind of a little bit all over the place with more or less significance. Uh, and uh, I forgot to mention that the dark blue color is the level of false discovery rate of 0.05. Uh, so the, uh, you know, when you get to the benign tissue in the um, cancer bearing prostates, the uh, for, for epithelial enrichment in epithelium, we get enrichment of, of sec secretory pathways. Then when we go to PIN, we get also added up uh, with RNA synthesis. And then the fourth category is the, the, they're the ones that arise when they're in the, the differences between tumor and stroma surrounding stroma. Uh, stroma surrounding tumor that will be RNA, protein, and lipid synthesis on the epithelial side. And in um, stroma surrounding uh, tumor that will be TGF beta, signal transduction, and bone remodeling. And signal transduction, cell migration, and geogenesis start to get dysregulated at the level of PIN. And then we have some immune regulation and uh, angiogenesis and cell proliferation uh, already seen in the stroma that is surrounding benign uh, epithelium, but in the prostate of a prostate cancer patient. Um, of course, with this data, we cannot really establish the direction if that's the tumor that influences the stroma or there is something going on in the stroma that actually influences tumor, but uh, these are observations that we've made from the uh, LCM experiment. Uh, next, oh, we looked um, at the uh, differences between uh, malignant stroma and benign stroma and malignant epithelium and benign epithelium. So this is the comparisons of tumor versus benign tissue in the epithelial compartment and stroma. Um, versus um, stroma surrounding tumor and stroma surrounding benign glands. All of these comparisons are done in the radical prostatectomy specimens, of course. 
So you can see pathways that are enriched in malignant field that will be translation, um, protein RNA complexes, uh, assemblies, different mRNA processing processes, translational in initiation, protein folding, and so on. Uh, we have um, downregulation of muscle development, cell matrix adhesion, and uh, cell substrate adhesion, and so on. Um, these are ones that are more enriched in. Um, so uh, th they're, th those are lost in the uh, malignant epithelium, and they're more enriched in the benign epithelium. In the stroma, uh, we have only muscle development that is lost. And, um, and it's more prominent in benign stroma. And this is uh, because the stroma surrounding a tumor, as I said, it, it acquires more fibroblasts. So it, lo you know, it loses its smooth muscle um, you know, self. Um, and these are the uh, upregulated pathways in the stroma, in the malignant stroma. We also we have protein uh, folding, Golgi vesicle transplants, uh, tra transport, uh, cell secretion, different metabolic processes, and so on. Uh, the uh, next comparison uh, that we looked at is the stroma adjacent to high and low Gleason grade. So all previous comparisons were paired comparisons where you know, we looked within the patient. Uh, here, these are comparisons across the patient. So we compared our 12 Gleason 6 cases to uh, our tw yeah, 12 Gleason 6 cases versus 13 uh, Gleason 8 and above cases. When we looked in the epithelium, so Gleason 3, pattern 3 epithelium and Gleason 4 epithelium, we found only one gene to be differentially expressed gene. It was an alchem gene. It's DG, DGF uh, beta responsive gene that is known to be associated with metastasis. But when we looked in the stroma comparisons, we looked at the stroma tumor of high grade minus low minus low grade, we have way more genes that were statistically significant. We actually found 24 genes to be statistically significant. Uh, and um, those genes were highly expressed in like, osteoblast-like cells and highly expressive in immune cells, T cells, B cells, macrophages, and so on. And several of those genes belong to the complement activation path. This is just the example of IHC validation. This is for the ALCAM and this is for SELF-1. And you do really see that, you know, you have um, enrichment of those genes here in the epithelium of uh, Gleason 4 plus 4 case versus 3 plus 3. And for the one of those genes in this signature, the SELF-1, you can see that it is more highly expressed in the stroma of the uh, 4 plus 4 case as compared to the 3 plus 3 case. So we have like one gene versus 24. We do know then the, that the, of course, the epithelium in low grade cases and high grade cases do differ. What we need to keep in mind that it was a reasonably small sample size. There are challenging, noisy samples. Uh, additional challenge come from that RNA is not also, you know, treated very, very gently during the LCM process. So it just suggests that there are pretty large uh, changes in stroma, even in comparison with the epithelium. But it doesn't mean, of course, that this is only thing, the only thing that we, you know, that is happening. It is not, you cannot make a conclusion that is only one gene that is really uh, differentially expressed. This is probably the artifact of the sample size, but it just gives you idea about the order of magnitude that we think that these changes in stroma are. These are the genes that we found to be differentially expressed. And here I'm uh, highlighting the genes from the complement activation pathway. And also uh, Oncotype DX uh, that is uh, commercially approved signature 
that, that is used for prostate cancer. Uh, we have three of the genes uh, in, uh, in, in the list that we find, they are in the oncotype DX assay. And those are, uh, you know, in the oncotype DX assay, they are um, assigned to the stromal genes. So um, it was interesting to observe that. So we're able to capture that. Uh, so these are the results from our laser capture microdissection experiment. And we also uh, tried to validate it in other studies. We uh, uh, looked at the differential gene expression of uh, the genes that we found in the DCGA data, and we have a pretty good concordance. Uh, we have um, a lot of them are significantly associated uh, with Gleason scoring DCGA data. But the other one is, I think this is a Mayo Clinic data. Uh, they are so with Gleason grade as well as with the outcome. And the outcome there, I think it was the development of metastatic disease. Next, what we've done, we looked at the um, single sample gene center enrichment score in original data and as well in the uh, cancer genome atlas data. So what we've done, we took our 24 gene signature and computed the single sample uh, gene set enrichment score to sort of uh, summarize the expression of all 24 genes into one value. And when we're looking at the stroma adjacent to the tumor, the, these scores in three plus three cases and four plus four, we have a massive difference. This is to be expected because this is how we selected those genes. All those genes actually were upreg, I don't remember if I mentioned that or not. All those genes that we found coincidentally uh, were upregulated in four plus four cases, um, as compared to three plus three. We didn't do any specific selection on the direction. It just happened so that all the genes that were differentially expressed were actually overexpressed in four plus four. It doesn't mean that there are actually uh, no genes that are downregulated in four plus four. We just didn't observe them. Again, we, you know, we have reasonably small sample size and noisy data. Uh, when we look at the stroma adjacent to normal, we did observe the difference as well. Those genes were not necessarily differentially expressed by themselves, but we do see the pattern in adjacent normal data. This finding is still a little bit questionable in a sense that we were not able to validate it in TCGA data. TCGA has a very small, reasonably small number of normal samples, but we didn't observe the difference there. And oh, we also need to remember that these are paired samples. So there could be some effect, you know, because they're from the same patients, we can see those remnants that is not, that it could be just patient specific and not necessarily reproducible in um, uh, normal uh, tissue. In general, we didn't see that association in DCGA. The way we done our validation in DCGA is interesting and also pretty instructive. So the uh, DCGA data uh, was uh, reviewed by pathologists. So the in um, in cancer genome atlas data, they have the blocks of tissue, which then they processed and produced multiple different assays. So they had DNA assays, they done some sequencing, uh, they had SNP arrays, they had the gene expression uh, RNA-seq data, they also done the methylation, methylation profiling. And all of these blocks that constituted the DCGA data uh, were reviewed by pathologists. They uh, sometimes seen only one slide of the block that was used for analysis. Sometimes they had two blocks from the top and the bottom of the block. Uh, they were reviewed by multiple pathologists um, from you know, leading pathologists in the United States. And they um, estimated the purity of the tissue. They estimated the tumor cellularity looking at the slides. And it turned out that you know, not all uh, specimens had the uh, same cellularity. 
Some had tumor purity less than 40% as estimated by a pathologist, meaning that those cases had a lot of stroma. However, there were also a bunch of cases that had very high purity. So they had over 80% of tumor in them, meaning that have very low percentage of stroma. And when we're looking at our signature in TCGA data, what we see is that we see difference between three plus three and four, four plus four and above. Uh, so we are able to validate. Interestingly, three plus four and four plus three follow the pattern. We do see the intermediate values of our signature there. We still see the signal in the highly pure samples, but its signal is, you know, it, it, it's much smaller. The difference is much smaller, uh, which also, you know, prompts us that it is important to know what is the tissue composition of the specimen that you are looking at. Um, so uh, this is what we expect to see when you don't observe too much of the tissue of interest in your sample, your signal is hampered. So I, I think this is interesting and instructive of the importance of selection of actual specimens that um, we will be doing sequencing on. So being inspired by these results from the LCM study, we, but you know, since it was a small study, uh, we decided to go for a bigger study. So this is the work that is uh, funded by NCI for a grant and uh, me and my colleague, Catherine Penny are uh, co-PIs of this grant. And our aims in that grant were to extend and validate the results of our LCM study. So we were interested in determining the association of stromal gene expression with clinical pathological features of the tumors and also lethal prostate cancer. We want to assess the association of stromal gene expression with tumor genet genetic alterations. Uh, we want to perform an expression uh, quantitative trait loci analysis in the stromal tissue, because you know there are certain risk SNPs that <clears throat> were discovered that pretty, you know, th 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 that are uh, risk SNPs for the prostate cancer. There are some genes uh, that are differentially expressed based on your SNP status. Uh, so that is our EQTL uh, in, uh, ep in uh, epithelial tissue and as well in, as in the malignant epithelium in the, uh, in the prostate cancer. But we want to see that maybe some of those <clears throat> risk SNPs who did not uh, who, who were not able to find these EQTLs for in the epithelium, maybe some of them have our EQTLs in, actually in the stroma tissue. And then we will, in the, our uh, final aim, we want to evaluate the cell type composition of stroma and its association with clinical pathological features in a lethal prostate cancer. This is our ongoing work. And I will tell you the result that we have so far for AIM-1. So, to study prostate cancer, sometimes it can be tricky because we know that biochemical recurrence is not a good surrogate for metastasis-free survival. So we really want to know actual lethal status. But because the uh, prostate cancer has such a long natural history, you really need to have decades of observation. So luckily, uh, the, at Harvard, we have access to those cohorts which have very, very long observation time. One of those studies is called the Health Professional Follow-Up Study. It began in 1986, and the pro purpose of, the, of that study was to evaluate different hypotheses about men's health, uh, you know, about the, how the diet, lifestyle factors, uh, whether they can find any uh, epidemiological, you know, factors and modifiable risk factors uh, for different illnesses, including cancer, heart disease, and other vascular diseases. So the uh, participants, it is still ongoing pretty much. Uh, the um, participants, they fill out questionnaires every two years. They have their dietary questionnaire every four years. And um, 
they report the incidence of cancer. So about 3,000 tumor blocks were collected from those cohorts. So all these men, they didn't have the prostate cancer at the baseline. Uh, there is a big blood repository, a lot of which will be pre-cancer bloods as well. And then as they develop prostate cancer, their blocks, tumor blocks are requested and the uh, tumor repository is constructed. The other part of it is the physician's health study. So physician health study, it was a randomized trial of aspirin and metacarotene. Uh, again, this cohort started a long time ago. 15,000 patients provided blood sample at baseline. Uh, the second part of the study is a randomized trial of vitamin C, vitamin E, and beta-carotene and multivitamin. And the goal of those, so, so those trials is to understand if they can be used as a prevention for different diseases, including cancer. So they will compare, you know, in, the, in, in this randomization there, the goal is to compare uh, the, the difference in the incidence of different diseases. So all participants start healthy. And uh, they are also followed up to this day. So from the PHS and PH, HPFS, what happens is that the, pay, the participants, they self first they self-report the incidence of prostate cancer, it then confirmed by medical records. Uh, the follow-up questionnaire is collected. The um, tumor is retrieved from the hospitals where they had their surgeries, and then uh, the follow-up um, we follow up follow them up for clinical endpoints, including death. Death is verified from the national death record, and um, uh, the um, medical doctors actually confirm that the uh, cause of death is actually prostate cancer. So we have actual lethal time point, which is very rare. And uh, we're very lucky to have this cohort. So in these cohorts, we, uh, so yeah, in, in the Harvard cohorts, there's a lot of data that are available. Uh, there are 12,000 prostate cancer cases, 6,000 of them are in the tumor cohort. And we have uh, a lot of biomarkers measured on them. We have uh, germline DNA, there is a blood plasma, we have information about lifestyle uh, and diet uh, and um, other factors of interest. Uh, and we have uh, clinical information on their prostate cancer, including Gleason stage, their PSA, uh, what treatment they received as an information of course and recurrence, metastasis and death. Um, the Gleason uh, is, was centrally re-reviewed for the tumor cohort, so we don't rely on the original hospital grading, and we have uh, the centralized re-review for all the cases. So for our study, what we've done, we had a pathologist, our colleague from Italy, who reviewed prostate FFP blocks and identified stromally enriched areas near and far from tumor. Uh, we use the true seq RNA exome capture method, which works reasonably well with the uh, FFP tissues. Uh, it, uh, since it targets only ac uh, you know, uh, exonic regions, we don't have issue of wasting too much reads on intragenic and intronic regions, which usually happens with FFP tissues. We used the STAR algorithm to align to HG38 to perform QC, but for analysis, we actually use gene expression quantification with Selman method. Selman method is uh, not aligning to the genome, it sort of partially aligns to the transcriptome, and it provides the estimated counts, expected counts uh, for each of the genes. Since uh, it was a large study, we had um, multiple batches. So we used COMBAT to control for batch effects, and we used VUMLOS um, pipeline to uh, normalize our data. Um, we can discuss a little bit more why we made those decisions, if you would like. Uh, and uh, we had... Uh, total number of cases was 293. This is the final number. We started with more cases. Uh, for some cases, we had both 
uh, stroma adjacent to tumor and stroma adjacent to benign glands. In this case, we for the ben stroma adjacent for, to the benign glands were taken from the block that did not contain the tumor. It was actually very far away from tumor. These are the uh, characteristics of these patients. And for some of them, we had paired tumor and stroma. We started with a larger number. Overall, we sequenced over 500 of samples, but the quality of the data wasn't that great. And we had a lot of things, a lot of samples that we lost because we, we had to filter them out because they were not looking good. So this is uh, overall uh, look at how our some QC metrics that we looked at. So we have total number of reads and you see some of them were just fantastic and we had a lot and um, uh, you know, a lot of them had very poor number of reads. Some of the samples that had very low number of reads where we ran and then we combined those data but they didn't necessarily produce more information uh, you add number of reads, but apparently the library complexity wasn't that great. So it didn't really improve things dramatically rerunning the sequences. We, we had to, we ran the sequencing. We didn't, didn't have a chance to redo the library preparation, unfortunately, because the quantities of RNAs were um, not that much. Uh, perhaps for a statistician, the most disappointing thing is this, you know, very you know, smooth decrease. So if you want to think that like, okay, I will declare this sample's bad and use the good one, there is no nice, you know, step function that you can rely on. Unfortunately, it looks like that. And um, I guess in the real world data, it always looks this sad and disappointing smooth curve. This is the uh, box plot of the total number of reads, you know, uh, as a function of the batch, we do not see any association whether, you know, that there was stroma tumor, stroma around around normal, uh, that 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 had worse performance. Uh, it was sort of random. Uh, we don't really have uh, well. Some batches are worse than the others, but it's it also not the case that you know there was one batch that clearly failed and everything was consistent. It just certain samples were not doing all that well. This is the percentage of uniquely mapped reads. And the higher numbers over here, over, you know, the ones that are over 60, this is due to the fact that this is exome capture. Usually we have, uh, you know, reads mapping to exons like with a different other library preps method. I have other library preps method, you can have like as low as 15% of the reads that are useful that are max mapping to axons. Here, it's uh, more decent. Uh, of course, there are some samples that looked pretty poorly. Um, there was no really rhyme or reason to it. These are the concentrations of the RNAs that we had. There is no clear correlation. Again, there were no significant differences between concentrations in the stroma tumor and the stroma normal. So um, we don't know why some samples are doing worse than the others. Again, this is the some QC that we looked at. This is the um, number of uh, reads in millions, and this is frequencies of the non-zero genes. So this is basically per sample how many genes you observe with non-zero counts. And for some of them, you basically get zero output. You don't have anything. So of course, we had to filter those samples out. The um, useful metric that I, I think, the metric that I think is useful is the interquartile range of counts per million. Uh, so if you have small interquartile range, uh, it usually means that, you know, it means that you don't have a lot of signal. You don't have um, any dynamic range uh, in your sample. So the samples that have very narrow, very small interquartile range are the ones that we filter out. So we, we essentially do the filtering based on the interquartile range and it gets read, automatically gets read of the samples with a small number of reads and with high frequency on, of uh, non-zero genes. 
So the, one of the comparisons that we've done is the stroma tumor and stroma benign as we looked at the LCM data. For this analysis, we have 99 paired samples. These are the pathways that we found to be differentially, uh, differentially uh, pathways enriched for the differentially expressed genes in this comparisons and their focal adhesion, adherence jun junction, smooth muscle contraction. So they're reasonably the pathways that we will expect to see, which we're happy about. So the ones that are muscle related, um, uh, that we talked about, we have TGF beta signaling pathway, interestingly. Uh, the FDR is not um, super impressive, but um, with, with the noisy data, FDR of 0.2, we believe is acceptable. And here I'm looking at the um, uh, collection, pathway collections from molecular signature database. So this is a CAG collection. These are the canonical pathways, geobiological processes, as well as hallmarks. And I'm just showing you the whole bunch of uh, significant ones from multiple different collections. We also compared uh, our differentially expressed genes to our LCM experiment. And I think the, uh, the concordance is pretty striking. So uh, we looked at the uh, genes that were differentially expressed <laughs> between stroma tumor and stroma benign in the LCM experiment. And this is the log fold change uh, in the LCM experiment. And remember, that was AFI array. Here we have our current data, which is uh, sequencing. Uh, and these are the log fold changes of the genes that were differentially expressed in the LCM data. The correlation of the log full changes, this is Spearman correlation, is, 80, is 0.83. If you look, uh, this is Spearman correlation. The Pearson correlation is a little bit lower. It's about 0.79 or something. Um, but, but we see a pretty good concordance. You will notice a gap here uh, in log full changes because these are the genes that were differentially expressed with the um, uh, log full change greater than with a full change greater than 1.5. So this is why we can, like, you know, the, the, there is this gap in log full changes that we don't observe. And if you have small log full change, you won't have the significance. So uh, we have some of them, they don't have exactly the same log full change, but the direction is there. And the genes that were shown to be uh, underexpressed in one of the compartments we still observe them in the correct direction in our new experiment. Um, I shouldn't say correct direction, in the same direction, which we hope is the, is the correct one. And uh, the same for the upregulated genes. So we find it to be a good sign that we have um, data comparable to what we uh, observed in the LCM experiment. And here it was not LCM, it was just areas enriched for the stroma. Uh, and because you have to core, you know, you don't really uh, observe all of the tissue that you are putting for the, uh, into the sequencer, essentially. And then we looked at the comparisons between how and high and low Gleason grade. For this specific analysis, to increase our sample size, we defined high Gleason as 4 plus 3 and 8 to 10, and low was 3 plus 4 and 6 and three plus four and three plus three, I apologize for the typo. So we included, in LCM experiments, we didn't have Gleason sevens here. We included Gleason sevens and four plus three went with high Gleason grade and three plus threes went with low Gleason, and three plus fours went with low Gleason grade. So in this uh, instance, we had 144 high and 125 low grade cases including this sevens that were split between the two. And these are the pathways that are differentially, uh, that are enriched for differentially expressed genes. Unfortunately, we do not find much of the significance in the uh, at the individual level. We do find uh, significant p-values. They do not really behave well with the uh, correction for the multiple testing. Um, but, uh, at the pathway level, we observe some interesting pathways such as collagen formation, um, assembly of collagen fibrils. Uh, we have some epithelial mesenchymal transition, myogenesis again, suggesting that there could be some differences 
again in the um, fibroblast composition and so on. We next looked at the, our LCM sig signature of 24 genes that we found in the LCM data. And here we were able to map out of 24 genes, we were able to find 20 genes in our data. Uh, we didn't observe the full transcriptome because we filtered out the genes that had very low expression, meaning that they were zero in most of the samples. Uh, which could be uh, for different reasons, even like the RNA degradation and so on. So we observed only 20 of the genes. And uh, this is the um, uh, single sample genes and enrichment score in three plus three cases, three plus four, four plus three, and eight to 10. And these are against the Gleason grade, that is the Gleason grade of the patient, of the whole specimen. And we have the difference. It is not as difference. It's um, marginally significant between three plus three and eight to 10. We have kind of disappointing pattern between Gleason and sevens. Uh, we also have some, uh, you know, non-conforming points, but overall the median is larger and high, higher values for the score for eight plus 10 as we observed in the other data sets. We also have the, Gleason score of the block from which the stroma was taken, which does not always correspond to the Gleason of the patient. Here we observe the following pattern. We still observe marginal significance. We do have high, a little bit higher <laughs> expression of the signature in the eight plus 10 cases, uh, but there is a lot of variability. We do have some uh, disappointing outliers. Uh, what we're now trying to look at is trying to understand this difference between the patient and blog Gleason and um, thinking um, whether those outlying points are actually can be explained out by the differences in patient and um, blog Gleason. So we, for our future directions, we already performed the multiplex IHC uh, on the um, 15 tissue microarrays that are constructed from the PHS and HPFS cohorts participants. Uh, on these tissue microarrays, we have around 1,000 prostate cancer cases that are followed up for lethal outcome. Uh, and from this, um, essay, we're planning to identify the prevalence of different stromal cell types and see if that is associated with lethal disease, whether associated with the Gleason grade and so on. <laughs> we're also interested in performing the analysis using nanostring digital spatial, uh, spatial profiling platform. We ran a successful pilot. I, I'm not showing it to you here, but we actually do see the signature from, we had only four cases, but you know, for three plus threes had low Gleason grade, um, uh, so that uh, stromal signature and the, we had higher signature expression in the uh, higher grade cases in multiple places of the stroma across the slide uh, for that patient. So this is an interesting platform that we're, we're very much interested in looking at, at as I told you at the beginning, the study of 25 cases using LCM took over two years. And with uh, digital spatial profiling, we can do it uh, much quicker and we can have more regions of interest per sample. And we can also study tumor stromal interface and as well as uh, stromal gene expression as a function of distance from the tumor. So we're uh, seeking to um, obtain funding for this project. The uh, group of people, the team for the LCM project with international and large group of people, the PIs of the projects were uh, Massimo Loda and Laura Laimucci. Um, uh, Massimo Loda unfortunately left Dana Farber and Vile Cornell now, uh, but uh, they led this effort, which was funded by Prostate Cancer Foundation. Uh, I was uh, honored to perform the data analysis for this project. Uh, our current project that uh, I'm working with, with my colleague, Catherine Penny from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard School of Public Health uh, at DFCI, 
uh, Ying Huang, she unfortunately also left. She was a pathologist who helped us with the uh, multiplex IHC uh, staining as well as with the RNA preparation. Zach Herbert is the He's the head of the um, sequencing core. Ying Lu Zhou is the master statistician in my department. Uh, she has been instrumental in putting all the data together. Uh, Dr. Loda from now from Weill Cornell, our long-term collaborator. We have uh, Charan Ma, she's a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Penny. And so she will be performing the QTL analysis. So if you're interested in that, you can hear, hear from her. And uh, Lorelai Mucci and my, uh, Mayor Stanford, our mentors. Uh, Lisa is helping with the, all the specimens bringing back and forth. Our colleagues from Italy are all pathologists. Uh, Nicola and Lavinia performed the actual RNA extraction for our project with the PHS and HPFS, uh, PHS and HPFS data. And uh, Dr. Fiorentino, he's one of the pathologists who centrally re-reviewed the, all the blocks for the tumor cohort. Uh, we're funded by the uh, R01 grant from the NCI and the prostate spore, as well as the uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation Challenge Award that funded the LCM project. And Catherine Penny was a young investigator from the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Um, thank you very much for listening. And um, I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. <laughs>